So good morning and welcome to the Laurier Northern webinar series. For those of you that have not joined before, this is a monthly series of virtual webinars that highlights Laurier's multidisciplinary Northern research, which is conducted in close collaboration with Northern communities, institutions, and partners in the Northwest Territories and other, other Northern locations. For today's webinar, we have five speakers bringing you different perspectives perspectives and research on Northern food security and community well-being. With all our webinars, we start with a land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University's Ontario campuses, situated on the Haldeman Tract, res reside upon the traditional territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land holds significance as part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, symbolizing their commitment to sharing, safeguarding resources, and living in peace with each other. Today, this gathering place serves as a home to numerous First Nation, Métis, and Indigenous communities from across Turtle Island. Additionally, we extend our respectful acknowledgement of Laurier's research activities in the Northwest Territories. Laurier has established permanent infrastructure in Yellowknife on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Dene, Inuit, and Métis people of the Northwest Territories, as well as their traditional lands of the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation and Chief Dry Geese Territory. We further extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of the North who call this territory home. We are grateful to the Indigenous people of the Northwest Territories for allowing us the privilege of learning, working, and residing on their lands. Additionally, we deeply appreciate the generous sharing of traditional knowledge, wisdom, and ways of knowing. To express our gratitude, we can engage in continuous learning, open dialogue, and thoughtful reflection about the rich histories, cultures, and contributions of Indigenous people. Through our ongoing learning efforts, we aim to foster understanding and build meaningful relationships with the Indigenous communities on whose land we live and work. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. I'll turn it over to Dr. Andrew Spring, the center's director, to tell you more about their research. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and uh, good morning. Uh, yes, yeah, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, uh, my name is Andrew Spring. Um, yeah, I'm the director of the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. I'm also the Canada Research Chair in Northern uh, Sustainable Food Systems here at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, yeah, representing the center, uh, the center, the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems connects researchers and community partners engaged in sustainable food systems change. We create opportunities for citizens, practitioners, policymakers, private enterprise, and academics uh, to work together to imagine and foster food systems that are fair, healthy, ecologically regenerative, uh, culturally appropriate, <laughs> prosperous, and inclusive. Uh, using food as a lever for positive change, uh, the center enables meaningful collaboration among people across institutions, sectors, disciplines to support community-driven research, uh, innovative knowledge sharing, and development of community resources uh, to foster more sustainable food systems policy. Our interdisciplinary work uh, cuts across multiple projects to create local and global networks that uh, help develop resilient food systems. Um, that's the mission statement, obviously, uh, for those of you who know me uh, and know some of the work that uh, the team does and the center does, uh, what the Laurier Center does is really this community-based research uh, around food systems. We've been working in the Northwest Territories across multiple communities uh, for uh, roughly uh, 10 or 11 years, which is basically the same age as, uh, as the center itself. Um, but our, I think what unites us as a center is this focus on uh, community-driven uh, food system change uh, and even kind of having conversations around food sovereignty uh, with, uh, with our partners and communities. Uh, so uh, as the center director, I get to introduce today. I don't get to do all the fun uh, presenting, uh, but you're going to hear a lot. Uh, a lot of the stories, and again, these are just a sample of some of the stories and some of the research uh, happening uh, across Northern communities uh, with some of our uh, colleagues and collaborators, uh, some students uh, as well. Uh, and we're happy to kind of, um, yeah, sh share the work. And please, uh, for more information, there's links to the center here. And I'm sure we're gonna make this uh, available to other people. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, if you wanna connect further. Uh, so thanks a lot and uh, yeah, enjoy the show.
Great, thank you, Andrew. Our first speaker today is Dr. Kelly Skinner, Associate Professor in the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario. So go ahead, Kelly, you can share your screen. Welcome everybody, so happy to be here and uh, to be the first presenter in this food security and well-being webinar. Um, I decided to talk about uh, our project in the projects in the Inuvialuit Settlement Region. Um, these projects are co-located and co-researched food system projects. Um, and I'm super happy also that uh, Sonia Ostertag and Richard Grubin are going to be speaking after me. So I'm going to try and set us up for sort of the broader picture here of what we've been working on as a large team um, within the Inuvialuit Settlement Region. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot about, you know, the really uh, um, high levels of food insecurity within the Northwest Territories. We all know that they're high um, and that really these food systems um, need to be supported and the food systems are across um, a variety of spaces. So that includes the country food system, uh, the retail or store-bought food system, as well as the agricultural um, locally uh, gathered food system. And there's a lot of impacts on these food systems. So in, in, in addition to things like colonialism and, and uh, colonization and the impacts that come from that, um, there's also climate change impacts, contaminants and food prices. Um, and I'm not going to cover this in too much detail today either, but I wanted to just highlight that these are also areas that um, we're considering and looking at. And uh, um, I'm going to focus more on the country food system during this presentation. So a lot of the research that we've been doing looks at these kind of questions. So what can we learn from northern food systems? How can we support and facilitate stronger self-determined food systems? And how can we use this learning to help maintain our access to good food in the face of climate change? And northern food systems are place-based and localized. So one of the the reasons for the impetus for this research is that community-driven initiatives are rarely evaluated. So um, you often get maybe evaluations of uh, large uh, federal programs or government-based programs, but those initiatives that have been driven by communities are not often evaluated or provided with evidence um, that then can be fed back up to those policy levels. So our aim is to use evaluation to build research evidence and to look at what works for whom and under what conditions. So really thinking about those contexts, um, the northern context, and in this case, um, I'll be speaking primarily about the Inuvial settlement region and the context there. So the main vis vision for this research is to broadly learn from an enhanced community capacity to address place-based priorities and to inform both climate change and food security action and self-determined support structures at local, regional, and territorial scales. Um, and a lot of this work really started um, from a large CHR team grant um, where we came together uh, to build this, uh, this team grant. Um, we had a number of partners to uh, write this application and work on the research questions that we wanted to look at. Um, but the broader research uh, with co-PIs Andrew Spring from Laurier and uh, Sonia Vesh from the University of Ottawa, um, as well as Sonia Ostertag at the time was a postdoctoral fellow and Tiffany Kenny a postdoctoral fellow then. Um, we brought together uh, community members and other stakeholders and rights holders from the Northwest Territories to Waterloo to design this grant. Um, and this initial large grant was to work with four regions in the Northwest Territories uh, and across six communities. Um, so there is a, a lot of um, uh, other projects going on within the Northwest Territories and within the other three regions, um, but I will be speaking about the Inuvia Outlet Settlement Region today and the case, some of the case studies that we've been working on there. Um, so the ISR has uh, six Inuvialuit or Gwich'in uh, Arctic communities. Um, we do have, through our large C4FS project, a regional food security coordinator um, who has been hired uh, in Politec. This is Selena Wolke. Um, and uh, you'll see her highlighted throughout this presentation. Um, in addition to Selena's uh, work with us, we also hire community research leads. Um, and those are integral to the, the projects that we're working on. And they've been very involved 
um, with all aspects of the research. So um, that includes uh, thinking up new research questions uh, or new priorities that might be for the communities, um, helping to make sure that we're using uh, appropriate methods and uh, collaborative processes, as well as the knowledge dissemination pieces. Um, so this is sort of a, a snapshot of some members of our research team. There's actually a number of members that aren't represented here, but I just wanted to highlight some of them. So in addition to our community coordinators and research leads, we have uni university researchers across several institutions and students. Um, and then at the various levels, we also have relationships with um, territorial, regional, and community organizations and governments. Um, so including uh, members of the GNWT, um, the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, uh, the Beaufort Delta Education uh, Authority, um, the community corporations in all of the communities and the Hunter and Trapper Committees, as well as Hamlets. Um, we also have now been involving the elders committees a lot more, and I'll speak briefly about that um, a little bit further in the presentation. So this is just sort of starting with um, how the research program looks across sort of five main um, studies. So the C4FS study that I mentioned as the initial sort of uh, way for us to come to together um, is there at the top of the blue bubbles. Um, we also had funding from CANNOR um, for uh, country foods and community program um, project. Um, and Sonia and Richard are going to speak from the Country Foods for Good Health project after me. Um, Tiffany Kenny at uh, the University of Laval has also been um, bringing in food costing aspects of, th of these projects. Um, so there are two uh, projects funded through Tiffany, the NNF4F project and a project funded by Nutrition North Canada. Across these um, co-located projects in the ISR, um, we really aim to do research capacity building, build on Inuvial values and knowledge, um, making sure that there are benefits to Inuvialuit from the research activities and any kind of programming that we're trying to support, um, bridging elders and youth, as well as knowledge mobilization. So we are, really are trying to focus on community-driven evaluation and research priorities that we hear from when we're engaging with the communities. And we also try and aim to um, have collaborative development of methods as well as um, communication and knowledge mobilization. Um, so some of this includes on the land gatherings, for example, or supporting on the land activities um, and thinking about various communication tools. Um, some of these communication tools end up being different. So um, in addition to things like uh, academic outputs, um, which uh, often our funders require us to have, so reports, for example. Um, we also uh, do regular newsletters. Um, we've uh, put our, our work into magazines as well as uh, there's a whole host of cookbooks. I'm not sure if Sonia's gonna mention it, but she's been working on many cookbooks across communities. Um, this cookbook in particular was one that Julia Jeppe, a previous student of mine worked on first, uh, called Mamaktak um, with the school in Taktiaktak. Um, we also have, uh, in addition to presenting back to the communities um, and, and co-presenting. So for example, Selena, when we present in Politak, um, she presents the research back with us. Um, we also have, uh, have the community research leads and other community researchers have come down to um, uh, present with us at ArcticNet, for example, in 2022. Um, and we've hosted regional and national gatherings where we can bring together um, the team and work together on the on the projects and thinking about where we're going next. Um, Sonia also had a workshop on co-interpretation of results at ArcticNet. Um, and we try as much as possible to co-present together. So I wanted to quickly share um, just briefly some of these food system case studies that we've been working on in the ISR. 
The first one is that CANNOR project where we're looking at country foods and community programming. Um, the goal of this project was to better incorporate country foods into schools, daycares, cooking circles, and youth centers, and to really look at existing programs and how country foods can be in incorporated there. Some of the things we did were to look at infrastructure and capacity. So we had an infrastructure survey. We looked at food processing and storage spaces in each community, um, thought about existing harvesting programs that could provide country food and where the linkages could be made um, from those programs into other uh, spaces like schools. Um, we looked at guidelines to support the long-term inclusion of country foods in programs, as well as opportunities to share this knowledge and expand it to other communities. Um, one example here was caribou soup that was um, done with uh, after a hunt and brought uh, Selena did this caribou soup um, with students at the high school um, and sort of from that CANNOR project we also worked on a country food preferences survey for students. Um, this was led by uh, Alyssa Salins as well as some community research leads. Um, we had artwork done by Shania Knox. Noxana from Tuk -tuk -tuk to really make this a visually based survey for students because there's very little information on um, directly from from youth and and young people about what they want to eat um, in terms of country foods, what kind of activities they want to participate, who they want to learn from, and um, what harvesting and preparation skills they might want to learn. One of the main findings from this country foods preferences survey was that start, students wanted to learn about country foods from their family members. And we've been able to use uh, some of this to feed into some of our other projects. For example, um, Maria Ramirez, who's a PhD student, um, has been working with actually community research leads across all six of the uh, ISR communities to look at elder and youth perspectives of country foods and has done uh, interviews with 46 elders and as well as a photo voice project with nine youth and talking circles with elder and youth. So she actually added family interviews um, to look at the generational aspect to this, um, to her, her dissertation thesis uh, because of some of the information we were getting from the rest of our project, uh, for example, the survey with students. Um, so just some highlights here is that today's experience with food is different for elders um, than their early life experiences of food. Um, they also highlighted the importance of family um, during those interviews um, and thought about cultural and traditional lifestyle changes, for example, um, the types of animals that have been harvested and eaten um, and uh, they really felt strongly about supporting youth through cultural and traditional um, activities um, and being able to do that in a much more concerted way so for example um, not just getting youth out on the land for short periods of time but actually getting youth out on the land for extended periods and making sure that they would get the experience right from harvesting the animal to processing the animal all the way through to um, bringing the animals back to the community. Um, we also in terms of sort of sharing back for example uh, bringing back uh, sort of findings to the community and co-presenting those findings. Um, for example, this February, we had an elders tea um, to share the findings from this project, um, the elder and youth photo voice uh, project. Um, and uh, this is an example where the elders have spoken up in the ISR and said to us they wanted to be more included. And so um, in addition to presenting and working with the, the community corporations and the hunter and trapper committees, we now invite also the elders committee to participate in those meetings. Um, another student, Lena Dedyakina at the University of Ottawa has also worked on an evaluation of the Nutrition North Canada Cooking Circle program. This was in direct collaboration with Selena Wolke, our project, uh, regional project coordinator, um, to look at the program's impact on food intake at knowledge, the program's intangible benefits like self-confidence as well as country food integration. Um, Amy Uris, who's a master's student working with me at Waterloo, who lives in Yellowknife, um, has been working on a community freezer project. This was in collaboration with um, ICEDO, so Brian Wade at uh, the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation um, to help design this, pro this 
uh, project to look at researching the role of community freezers for food security, to looking at what works and what isn't working, um, things like individual versus community freezers, what the freezer management looks like. So this was interviews with freezer managers um, in all six of the ISR communities where there were freezers, um, as well as interviews with um, community members about their use of the freezers. We're also working on a new project um, around diabetes. So this is really coming from the communities themselves. We heard from several communities that diabetes management has been a significant challenge. Um, so we're currently applying for funding to look at experiences and supports for diabetes in Polytech and other ISR communities. We're starting with women's experiences around gestational diabetes, um, thinking about the ability to manage diabetes with limitations of food sources as well as healthcare access. And Sana uh, Hussain and Selena Wolke are working closely together on this project. So I'm going to end there, and uh, I look forward to hearing from Sonia and Richard about uh, their work in the same re region. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. Our next presenters are Dr. Sonia Ostertag, Research Assistant Professor at the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario, and Richard Grubin, Community Research Lead in Harvester in Tuktoyaktuk, Northwest Territories. So go ahead, Sonia and Richard. So this is exciting that Richard was able to join me today for this presentation. Thank you, Richard, for making time to come and co-present on the Country Foods for Good Health project and really focusing on the importance of monitoring animals in the Inuvialuit settlement region. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging that we're part of a really large team. And as you can see uh, in the top purple rectangle, the names of a number of people who've been really involved to different degrees in our project from community research leads and elders, school staff, um, and uh, folks at the Univalent Regional Corporation and the Joint Secretariat and the ISR. And we want to acknowledge the all the knowledge shared by elders and harvesters over the number of years of this project, but also before this project started. Um, since 2006, I've been learning from elders and harvesters in the Univalent Settlement region. And um, I know that Richard's been learning for his whole life from his community as well. And then you can see all of the academic and government partners across Canada. So we wanted to dive into the Country Foods for Good Health project in a little bit more detail. Um, and this project has a number of components. Some of those were discussed a bit in, in Kelly's talk just before mine and Richard's, but we wanted to share that we've been working on a nutrient and risk assessment from for country foods. We've been working with elders to record their knowledge and children and youth to hear about their perspectives and experiences and a large focus on the communication of messages and results from our work. And I just wanted to acknowledge that the first three drawings that you can see are from Shania Noxana from Tuktoyaktuk. And traditional knowledge and values are really the found at the foundation of everything we're doing for Country Foods for Good Health. This work was developed very closely with the communities of Tuktoyaktuk and Polotuk and with the Nubialwit Game Council and the IRC. And so this work is really partnered with the Nubialwit and um, it's taking a co-production of knowledge framework where we don't just take samples and analyze them, but we work together with the communities to make sure that the Inuvialuit knowledge and values are part of every step of this research. Good morning, good morning. Um, I grew up out in the land um, pretty well most of my life. And uh, my kids are doing the same thing. I have six children and two grandsons. But um, overall, you know, our country foods are, um, our main diets of our country foods is uh, caribou, fish, geese, lugo whale. And um, I see ptarmigan in there too, but the ptarmigan, <clears throat> I just started meeting with different peoples uh, in, you know, in our community. They're just starting to learn how to cook the ptarmigan as well too. So that's our diet. And then the, we introduced, um, well, the community was introduced to moose and muskox in the last few years and people are still trying to learn how to prepare it so 
um, hopefully things work out for them. And, you know, it's same thing as, um, you know, dealing with a caribou and things like that. But people, people are different. They have different mindsets. And um, Harvesting Country Foods connects our, to all of our traditional values. And, um, you know, we always say, well, you always, um, when you go out and do a harvest, you're not always successful, but when you are successful, you get a lot of, um, you bring a lot of um, meats and geese and stuff like that home and it, it bring down, brings down your cost of living from buying groceries from the store. And um, for this one, I think it, it is important that we um, <clears throat> acknowledge our, um, you know, science, science research and our, um, what do you call it, our local harvesters and our way of life. You know, we, we don't know what pollutants are in the animals most times. You know, the fish have, um, they start having pus in their bodies and stuff like that. And same with the caribou. You know, they got different diseases, you know, brucellosis. And some people actually got sick from our, in our region from brucellosis and they, they didn't even know about. And then now we're learning about the mercury levels in the, uh, you know, in the fish and the whales and stuff like that. I know. And one is uh, community harvesting. You know, we teach our young, not our young, but our children to um, not only us, I'm, I'm sure it's the whole community teaches children how to harvest and proper ways of harvesting. You know, you get what you, um, you get what you harvest, what you can handle, we always say. And, um, you know, we teach them don't over harvest or stuff like that, you know, harvest for your, um, for your family's needs. And right there, I can't really, there's too small drawing, so. We, um, <clears throat> for sampling, we, we, when we do the harvest, we grab the tissues and we, um, we freeze it. And then it's, um, I think I'll let Sonia talk about this one. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, yeah. Richard. So um, Richard in Totiaktak was able to collect samples of country foods. So um, the foods are harvested in the community or outside of the community. And we had we had foods that have been harvested in all six communities and they were shipped to Waterloo. And so Richard was able to ship many samples um, from his harvest and from community harvests as well and from other community members. And this gave us a really great um, set of samples of the different foods eaten in the community. And once they were sent to Waterloo, we um, a number of us were really busy in the lab subsampling all of these foods and we would take the raw tissue and prepare and prepare it the way it would be prepared in the community. So Richard gave us a lot of guidance on how that should be done uh, for those samples that were provided raw and then other samples were already prepared in the community and so those could be subdivided. So there's a lot of work that we did in the lab um, so that we could send the samples to the different um, labs for analysis and they've been analyzed for metals, persistent organic pollutants, zoonotic diseases, and fatty acids and vitamins. And uh, we had hundreds of samples, I think about 800 samples total that were analyzed. And so we were interested in knowing about the heavy metals, um, persistent organic pollutants, and micronutrients in the foods. And we also partnered with the veterinarians um, in Saskatchewan and Alberta. So Susan Coots and Emily Jenkins and their teams to characterize animal exposure to select zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases are diseases that can be transmitted from, human, from animals and wildlife to humans. And so we had those samples analyzed where possible. And then we were able to assess benefits and risks using the dietary intake data from the Inuit health survey from 2007 and 2008. And Richard will talk a bit about the co-interpretation of results. Okay. Um, I think the best way for these uh, to give the results to the communities is to sit down with your, um, your directors from your hunters and trappers committee. And also, I think you got to throw in there is the, um, the um, 
community corp community corp um, representatives too and you know from my knowledge um, you know we sit with them we sit with the researchers and then for ourselves we uh, we know what contam not food contaminants but we know what foods are um, okay and that to you know we teach our young to um, tell them what's good and what's not good if they see something different on animals and you know you just leave it for a, or take pictures of it or whatever you can do and then you know, oh, you, you, know you explain stuff like that to the community too so um hope like when you explain to the community you got to have it like uh like clear plain english a story they can understand and i'm glad sonia was on we worked with Sonia on this project and then we let the community understand really good. Thanks Richard. And the other piece here is as a researcher, it really gives the significance of the results. So the way that a community member sees the information, not only the language we use, but just the results themselves, the, the significance, what those results actually mean for a community member, it's really difficult to imagine as a Southern researcher. And that's why this um, co-interpretation is really important, but also working in partnership with research leads. And so that way we have this ongoing communication and dialogue. And over the years, um, working in Tuk 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 and Paula Tuk, being able to have consistent um, engagement with those HTCs, Hunters and Trappers Committees and community corporations gives us that opportunity to constantly work together on understanding what the research questions need to be, but also what the results mean and how they can best be communicated. So that leads to the communication of dietary health messages. So our work really provides the quantitative data about sources of nutrients and potential risks, and that and these are co-interpreted with communities. But the dietary health messages themselves need to be co-developed by the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, Joint Secretariat, and Department of Health and Social Services using these outcomes from our project. And it's really important to emphasize, based on a survey that we did um, in, the, in the ISR with 198 participants, that Inuvialuit are very confident about the quality and safety of their country foods. And therefore, it's really important to recognize that the messages coming from this research and other research on country foods really shouldn't be creating unnecessary worry and anxiety about country foods that are extremely nutritious and connecting people to their community and culture, like Richard was saying earlier. And so um, that communication piece is really critical. So overall, I wanted to really acknowledge the, the importance of the community research leads in our work as critical members of our team, um, using a co-production of knowledge approach really is, uh, ensures that the nutrient and risk assessment um, is done in a respectful way and that, that we have a lot of reciprocity built into the work we do, like Kelly had talked about the cookbooks, which I didn't bring up, but we do a lot of work to make sure that we're not just extracting samples and data and um, benefiting in the South, that there's always an exchange happening and, um, as much generosity as possible, and that the trusting relationships that we can develop in this work um, are really critical. And finally, that ongoing collaboration with the local, regional, and territorial partners is essential for successful project outcomes. So thank you. We'd like to acknowledge our funders and partners, and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Charlie Spring, postdoctoral fellow at the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. So go ahead, Charlie. Um, so hi everyone. Um, I am honored and just a little bit nervous to be presenting for the first time to a Northern audience. My name's Charlie Spring. I'm a human geographer with the LCSFS and I'm a relative newcomer to this land. Um, I am a settler residing in Treaty 6 territory in Alberta, which is where I'm speaking to you from today. So I'm going to share some initial thinking that our team has been doing around some of the challenges facing small scale fisheries in the NWT. And this is a relatively new field of study for me. So I will really welcome feedback from anyone today. Any questions? Um, and I'd love to make contact with anyone involved in fishing who'd be interested in helping us understand some of these issues better. 
And if anything I say today isn't clear, um, or if I make any uh, mistakes, I'd love to hear as well. So um, please share your feedback in the chat. And just a quick nod to my co-authors, who include Jen Temmer and Kelly and Andrew, who you've already heard from, and members of the Kagitu First Nation in Kakisa, who first inspired the research that we're introducing today. Okay. Oh. Forward. There we go. So our research grew from recognizing just how important Kakisa's fishery is to food sovereignty. The community of Kakisa is located by Kakisa and Tatalina Lakes, as shown on this map, and they are fed by the Kakisa River, which is a, tri a tributary of the Mackenzie River or the Decho. And its very big watershed actually drains 20% of Canada. The path of the river and its lakes have been part of vital migration and trade routes for indigenous peoples for thousands of years, um, but they've also attracted settlers seeking to exploit mineral deposits, hydroelectric power, and also fish. Fish are really a vital source of both food and income to the community of Kakisa and to many other small-scale fisheries. Some of the challenges facing both commercial and Assistance fisheries include a rapidly changing climate and warming waters that affect fish habitats and fish behaviours, pollutants from industrial activities, and the devastation wrought by wildfires, floods, and more recently, pandemics. Community members have described to us some of their memories of the, of the kind of boom days of the Great Slave Lake fishery with its periodic stock collapses, and also the dominance of license holders and fishing companies from outside of the region. Um, and some of the challenges persist to this day, uh, including logistic and marketing challenges in moving fish around the region, declines in catches, and some of the difficulties in attracting young fishers to the industry. But this history has also seen a lot of change in how fisheries are governed, including the shifting role of the territorial government of DFO and the Freshwater Fish Marketing Corporation. So our research is attempting to ask who holds the power to affect decisions around fisheries management, particularly how to protect fish ecosystems, but also the livelihoods and food security of smaller scale and indigenous harvesters. So just as some general background for this research, um, social movements have been organizing transnationally for protections and rights for small scale fishers for years including the World Forum of Fish Harvesters and Fish Workers, which is allied with the global food sovereignty movement. Canada has endorsed the UN's voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication, sometimes just called the small-scale fishing guidelines. And along with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, these agreements put pressure on national governments to ensure Indigenous participation in decisions around nat um, natural resource management. But it's worth mentioning that despite these official agreements and court cases asserting inherent indigenous rights to fish, there have been times where the Supreme Court of Canada has used conservation as a principle to limit Aboriginal and treaty fishing rights. So our research, we take a, a, a critical view of conservation as something that has at times been used as a tool of colonial oppression. For example, who is able to set quotas who decides which fish are quota fish and what agency do communities have to inform some of these decisions? So with that in mind, I'm gonna share some of our initial thinking about how agroecology could be used as an approach that bridges conservation with concerns for social and economic equity. Agroecology is a global social movement and a food system philosophy that has roots in Latin American and indigenous farming and land use practices, and it has become a globally recognized food policy tool. Our understanding of agroecology is that it emphasizes respect for ecological limits, as well as presenting a radical and transformative set of principles for food system change that really prioritize people over profit. And this report um, by the Transnational Institute notes that small scale fishers have often been overlooked in discussions of food sovereignty and agroecology, despite the really significant contribution of fish harvesters to community food security. So we've been drawing on um, 
the five dimensions for an agroecology of the north, as outlined by Mindy Price and her colleagues in, a, in this paper in, in 2022. And those dimensions are governance, knowledge, economies, cultural and social aspects, and environmental stewardship. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll just run through how we're applying some of these categories to our thinking around fisheries. So first, I'm considering governance and knowledge together because particular kinds of knowledge tend to underlie governance arrangements and to shape their outcomes. And by governance, I just mean the kind of the constellation of people who affect decisions and how things get done. Mainstream fisheries management has generally been informed by Western scientific knowledge systems that often assume a split between human and natural systems and often place economic needs at the center of decision making by seeing fish as primarily a, an economic resource. Kristen Lowett and her colleagues point out that this means that while subsistence and commercial subsistence and ceremonial fishing are permitted without licenses, indigenous commercial fishers are often subject to colonial laws that can conflict with their inherent rights and traditional knowledge. We've learned from indigenous fish scholars who've applied two-eyed seeing to fisheries. And two-eyed seeing is, is learning to see from one eye with the strength of indigenous ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strength of mainstream West ways of knowing, and to use both of these eyes together with emphasis placed on the responsibility to act on the basis of one's knowledge. So this isn't really a case of just integrating traditional or indigenous knowledge into fisheries management, but actually involves challenging the ways of knowing that are used by dominant decision-making institutions. So as we've mentioned, legal instruments such as UNDRIP compel some of these institutional changes, um, and this is slowly happening. Um, AROM could be considered as an example of two-eyed seeing where community-based monitoring relies on the knowledge of harvesters about the relationships between living things in their environments, which is knowledge that's embodied and that's really deep rooted in long-term relationships to land and water. Um, and the paper I've shared here describes some research with the Slave River and De Delta Partnership, where communities and scientists co-produced research into environmental changes that affect fishing. And this was part of the NWT Water Stewardship Strategy. Their research included interviews with elders, considering elders as experts in cultural practices and knowledge transmission in their communities, alongside academic and governmental experts in their various fields. So by agroecological fisheries government, governance, we mean more than co-management and really moving towards thinking what about what knowledge and expertise are and where they come from and how they are shared and transmitted. Okay. So in terms of economies and sociocultural aspects of fisheries, um, Agroecology challenges the commodification of nature, and it advocates for markets and ways of distributing fish and other resources that support long-term sustainability and community thriving, and that align with indigenous values, treating fish as food and as kin over their status as an exploitable resource or as, an, or as a commodity. Kakitu First Nation has both a small commercial fishery and also a subsistence fishery, um, which provides vital cultural and ceremonial functions, as well as being important to food security. Fish is shared as well as being traded, and in some cases is sold. Other scholars have looked at how commercial and subsistence fisheries can coexist um, without conflict by, for example, using different fishing seasons and different locations for fishing. Um, our team is still collecting and working through our data on how different forms of fish exchange operate in the NWT. So I just wanted to share with you a, a model from a more urban and coastal context, which I think is interesting for its attempts to balance harvester incomes with broader community and biodiversity concerns. So this is the example of community supported fisheries. Um, and like community supported agriculture, these are models that try to strengthen the, link, the links between fishers and eaters. And they often in incorporate diverse values into their business models, including strengthening local control over food systems and building local knowledge and skills. So this is an example of a CSF from Philadelphia called Fishadelphia, and it embeds anti-racism, youth engagement, 
and affordability into its programs. So given the possibility of a regional food hub for the Northwest Territories, um, I thought it might be useful to share these kinds of models in thinking about alternative marketing possibilities from those that have historically dominated in the region. Okay, so just to conclude, um, many indigenous fisheries uphold non-capitalist values that prioritize land and water stewardship over the commodity status of fish, whereas state-led fisheries policy has tended to be concerned for, um, by fish as a community as a as a commercial resource. So we're treating stewardship, which is the the, the fifth dimension of, of agroecology. Um, we consider stewardship as a way of bringing together commercial and subsistence needs. Um, and it allows us to see traditional fishing practices and knowledge as really as forms of conservation, conservation of ecosystems, but also conservation of livelihoods and traditions. The knowledge practices underlying such stewardship are not fully reflected yet in mainstream conservation and government policy, but programs such as AROM are sowing the seeds for two-eyed seeing and more agroecological approaches to fisheries management. And I just wanted to finish by sharing the work of Zoe Todd. Um, the work of Zoe Todd has really helped me understand some of the complexities and the possibilities of decolonizing fisheries. She's a Red River Métis scholar who describes some of the creative ways in which in Inuvialuit fisheries um, and fishing communities in Palatuk assert some of their own indigenous legal and governance orders in the face of uh, environmental and colonial harms. She also makes cool fish art, so I thought I'd share one of her pieces here. So in this preliminary stage of research, we've been asking how different approaches to fisheries management could contribute to the stewardship and the care for fish, uh, waters and people. We'd like to conduct more interviews with fishing communities and managers to see if some of our ideas and questions fit with the realities and experiences on the ground. So these are just some of the questions we're asking that I'll leave on the slide. And if anybody would be interested in talking further about um, their experiences with fishing, please do get in touch. Um, I would also be glad to share any of the papers or any of the examples that I've, um, that I've given if anyone wants to know more. So feel free to get in touch and thank you so much for listening and thank you for the invitation to present today. Great, thank you so much, Charlie. Our final speaker today is Jennifer Temer, PhD candidate at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at, in Waterloo, Ontario. So go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much for the invitation to, to speak today. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about some of the work that, um, that I've been doing in collaboration with uh, the Kage Two First Nation, uh, Kihisa. So um, as Lisa said, my name is Jennifer Temer, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. So I work with Dr. Andrew Spring and Dr. Allison Blay Palmer. And over the past few years, I've been collaborating with the Kagei Two First Nation to design a strategy um, and implement sustainable food projects aimed to increase food security and community well-being, and also to support their vision for a sustainable food system. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kisa Community Garden, the community's progress to date, um, and how together we're working to build sustainability into the project over the long term. So as Charlie mentioned, uh, you'll, you'll notice a similar map. Uh, Kisa is located in Treaty 11 on the traditional territory of the Kage Two First Nation. It's located about 400 kilometers south of Yellowknife. Uh, Kikisa is the smallest community in the NWT, uh, with about 35 community members. So many people in the community, they harvest food from the land to sustain themselves and their family members. But in recent years, uh, climate change has made it more difficult and much more expensive to access traditional foods. There's also no store in, Kis in Kikisa, so in order to supplement their diets, community members need to drive um, pretty substantial distances, either to Hay River or to Yellowknife, in order to purchase food. Since about 2023, Kikisa has been 
working closely with researchers uh, at the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems in order to address the immediate and long-term impacts of climate change on their traditional food systems and declining access to healthy food within the community, as well as to support the community's priorities related to self-governance and food self-sufficiency. Together, um, we've started uh, a number of community-based projects that focus on, on things like recycling and waste reduction, composting, uh, as well as food production and distribution. The community garden and greenhouse is just one of those projects. So the timeline for Kikisa's garden project, it stretches over about 10 years. Uh, in and around 2014, the first raised beds were installed near the mouth of Kikisa Lake. So you can see that in the top left corner. Um, and jumping forward, since 2021, uh, the garden and greenhouse has produced enough food to provide every household with a, veg a vegetable box um, for up to eight weeks um, each summer. But we still have questions around you know, sustainability of the project. So last summer, we sat down with community members in order to develop a community food action plan. And part of that process was to do an analysis of community assets. The purpose was to identify what assets are available at the community level and what gaps we need to fill in order to support that long-term sustainability of all of the community projects that we're working with. The greenhouse and garden, uh, it has some specific needs. So these include infrastructure, capacity and knowledge, labor, regional networks, and funding. Also from our analysis, we found that the community, it already has many, many assets, but that when starting a new food project like gardens, new skills, knowledge, infrastructure, and management, all of those things that are needed, um, they don't currently exist presently at the community level. So the community is taking two approaches in order to fill those, research, those resource gaps. First, um, Kikisa seeks, they, they look for uh, regional supports from local organizations and individuals. And then further afield from that, um, students, students also support through the, the, the KTFN Laurier partnership. So this helps to address immediate needs to establish things like infrastructure, to increase food production and to support community efforts over the short term. The, the second approach they take is that community members participate in regional training initiatives in order to support capacity building uh, to manage the garden over the long term. So now what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of an update and walk you through each of the different sort of asset categories um, that I had laid out, those specific needs, uh, and let you know kind of where we're at. So first, um, every community project, every community garden needs infrastructure. Um, and we definitely have a lot of it. <laughs> since, since 2021, we've been working really, really hard to build up the, the infrastructure necessary to make this garden work over the long term. We've been working on compost, um, composting in order to improve overall, overall soil health. We currently have one greenhouse. It was built in 2021, and we'll be installing a second greenhouse this spring. We also have about of a quarter of an acre plot for root vegetables that we are continuing to expand um, and we'll be we'll keep doing that over time. We also have some raised beds that are placed in areas around the garden that would otherwise be unusable because of their locations or really just because the soil is very compacted in that area. And finally, we're also going to be installing a drip irrigation system this spring uh, for the whole uh, garden area in order to be able to reduce our, our water use and make watering just a little bit easier for community members. So another area that was really, that's really important that um, we've been putting a lot of time and effort into is capacity and knowledge. So I've put these two together, um, but there are really two key elements here. First, we need to know how to grow food. Technical expertise is something that 
you really need to learn over time through trial and error and by sharing. So if a community decides, you know, they want to grow food without having done done this sort of um, this sort of activities in the past, then support and training is really important. And that's definitely the case in Kikisa. So through this research, we've we have we've hosted three regional training workshops and garden volunteer days with participants from uh, from Kikisa, from Samba Kay, and from Jean Marie River. Um, for these trainings, we really we emphasize hands-on activities, learning by doing, and and knowledge sharing. The second is that capacity and knowledge is also important for project management. Building local capacity for people to manage projects, lead activities, do reports, and seek funding is important over the long term. And in Kikisa, we, we have a number of people who are supporting this work, but we're always looking for new ways to build capacity at the community level so that the community can take more ownership over this part of the, of the project. Next, we have labor. Um, that comes in the form of both employment and volunteering. We really need people in the community to work and volunteer their time in order to carry out all of these activities that we're, that we're doing in the garden. So uh, we, we currently have one full-time seasonal employee who, who works in the garden project, as well as some of the other food projects that we have on the go. Um, in the past, we've also had local youth who were paid through summer jobs. And we also coordinate with the school in order to bring youth out to, to help with some of the work. Through the research partnership, we also have students who come in and live in Kikisa for the summer, and they help out wherever, that, wherever it's needed in order to make sure that the, that the garden is, is healthy. And this summer, we're actually planning a more formal volunteer program for both youth and adults in the community. And we're also going to be increasing our communications so that people are better informed and they have more opportunities to come, come help and learn with us in the garden. Next, we have networks. Uh, networks of like-minded people doing similar work are very, very, very crucial. Um, they share resources, knowledge, and lessons learned, and they also help communities and individuals to feel connected to a larger idea or movement. A network can help motivate and build a sense of pride in the work that communities are doing, and it also emphasizes the importance of food security and overall community well-being. And then finally, obviously, not last but not least, um, all of this takes funding and support. And for Kikisa, this has meant support for grant writing, research students, support from government programs, from local organizations, and many, many others. And you could just see here all of the all of the logos. Um, I'm sure that there are many, many more um, that are not even present here. So uh, before I wrap up, I just want to share some preliminary findings. I think that this is this is a good way to sort of sum up some of the things that we've been we've been um, we've been seeing so far. So to date, really an important finding of this research has been that Kikisa and other communities they tend to access regional assets um, by using their existing social capital. So social capital is really the connections and relationships with organizations, communities, and individuals across the region to who help support, who can help support their efforts. But for Kikisa and many other indigenous communities in the North, the social capital that they have is not necessarily with the people, organizations and institutions who hold the knowledge, skills and funding they need to sustain their garden program. So there's a mismatch there. Um, in this case, um, the KTFN Laurier partnership has actually acted as a bridge to connect Kikisa to the resources and people who can support their work. And so moving forward, um, there's really a need for ongoing regional support. That regional support needs to come from government, from grassroots organizations and associations um, to convene with communities in order to build a regional network that supports capacity development, 
knowledge and resource sharing, and also policy shifts that consider Indigenous values and worldviews. This may help to address that issue of mismatched social capital. Work is really needed to build relationships of trust that support community agendas, and per particularly those agendas that, that focus on cultural revitalization, food sharing, sustainable harvesting, and food sovereignty. And on um, a sort of similar note, uh, also moving forward as communities are, for communities to support each other, they really need to be able to access the resources and contribute to their extra food to at the regional system within to the regional at the regional level within the regional food system. So any type of regional model, it should really provide a way to facilitate regional food sharing, sale, and trade, and also incorporate supports for communities um, in order for them to be able to maintain their projects, their gardening projects over the long term. Uh, and I will I will leave it there. Thank you very much. I'd really like to, uh, yes, just say thank you. And I hope you enjoyed that. Great. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> okay, we have some time, a short period of time for questions. And the questions are for you, Jen. What kind of greenhouses are used? Uh, is food produced year round? Or is it basic season extension tunnel? Uh, they're basic season, uh, season extension um, tunnels at this point. We don't have any electricity um, at the garden at the garden site. Um, Kikisa is a diesel community. They they don't have like they they are connected through a diesel generator, and so part of that, as well as this, I'm hoping to make this a, a really sustainable project, is that um, we don't use electricity at the garden site. Um, we haven't had any issues with gardens with the bear. I just saw a comment, but we haven't had any issues with bears so far in the garden, just groundhogs, uh, <laughs> which are possibly more destructive than the bears would be. Um, the greenhouses themselves are, the, the first one that we had is, um, it's actually aluminum and it's just a, a poly sheet. It's more like um, a long tunnel. The new one that we have has a pretty significant snow load and um, a hard hard siding. So we'll be able to do a lot more with it. Okay, great. Another question, are any of the produce preserved, for example, pickling or drying? Um, at this point, so we, at, at this point, we've been able to produce enough food for the community to be able to give it to them directly. Um, and so there hasn't really been the, the need for, for like preserving and that sort of thing. That being said, moving forward, it's something that the community has has spoken a lot about. We've done a little bit of canning and a little bit of pickling, but moving forward, it's something that we're really going to prioritize. Um, drying, pickling, different kinds of preserving, making jam, that sort of thing, um, in order to be able to extend the the life of the of the vegetables and food that we're producing within the garden for the community. Uh, someone was asking if what kind of food crops are grown and how did you arrive at this choice? Oh, um, there are <laughs> everything under, I would say almost everything under the sun, honestly. Um, lots of tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, um, turnips, carrots, beets, radishes, uh, the list goes on, potatoes, lots of root vegetables. Uh, so we took a lot of time to ask community members what vegetables they really wanted to, they liked to eat. Um, and then planted those and moving forward, every time we hand out uh, vegetable boxes at the end of the season, we ask people again, what did you like in your vegetable boxes? What did you not like? And so we, we do surveys on a regular basis to make sure that we're getting constant feedback from community members. Okay, uh, another question for you, Jen. Can you tell us more about the goals and activities of the networks you mentioned? Uh, Yes. So there aren't any, well, okay. So I wouldn't say that there are no networks specifically within Kikisa right now. Um, through the, the, through the Laurier and like KTFN partnership, we have the Northern Agriculture Futures Program. And that, um, that program, it actually connects a number of different communities. So it connects Sambake, uh, First Nation, uh, Jean Marie River, 
the Hamlet of Enterprise, Kikisa, um, Cat Lodice, and I think that that is about it for the timing. There are about five or six communities. And so through that, through that research program, we bring together um, communities as they're able to do trainings with them um, and to support their various different food production and uh, gardening programs. So that's kind of the main um, network at this point that especially Kikisa is involved in. The other, I wouldn't necessarily call it a network, but it is um, another aspect of my research has been looking at how, where, where Kikisa shares food. So what does the food sharing network, the, the traditional food sharing network look like? And that's connected that, them out to, um, I'd say around 20 different communities within the Decho region, uh, northern part of Alberta, as well as into the Satu and a few other, um, and the, the sort of like the South Slave. So Kikisa has a pretty broad network um, that they draw from as far as social capital is concerned, but that's specifically around traditional food. Uh, and another question for you, Jen. Uh, how long did it take the community to buy in uh, to the program? Yeah, I, I think that like there was a lot of time between when the project started in and around 2014 to really when I came on board in 2021. Um, during that time, there was, uh, it was very small scale. So there was, there were just a few raised beds and some people like planting some things in it at the front of the community in order to kind of experiment with it and see what, what, what could grow. Um, really in 2021, that was the first year we had the greenhouse and we were able to produce enough food to make an impact in people's food budgets and like show them that this was worth, this was worth pursuing and that we could actually really do something here. And so I think that like by the end of the year of the season in 2021, people were really into, um, they really had a lot more buy-in. So that hasn't necessarily as of yet really equated to more physical um, like volunteering and participation in the garden on a regular basis, but people are always happy to talk about it. They love to give their opinions and they will help out if and when um, whenever they're asked. So the buy-in really, I'd say by the end of the first year when people started to, to get vegetables on a regular basis, that was, that was sort of when that happened. Uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, someone sent me a question for Sonia and Richard. Is this a project that you will implement in other communities, potentially specifically the testing? Uh, absolutely. So we were asked to to expand to all six communities of the Inuvialuit settlement region. So that's what we focused on. Um, and we're just wrapping, well, we've wrapped up all the analysis. And then I suppose if other regions were interested, we could work there. But I think like in Inuit Nanungat, there are other researchers in the other regions that might be more equipped to do community-based collaborative research. But um, yeah, we've conducted this in the six communities and in February, uh, 2024, um, the Olahaktomi HTC in Olahaktak, they asked for us to collect additional samples to better represent all the foods in their community. And so we're working on um, to expand the sample collection there. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, I'll try to get to some questions for Charlie. Uh, what are your next steps you're considering for your research and to build on your findings? Um, thanks, Mickey, for that question. Um, I am trying to do everything I can before I go on maternity leave in August. So um, I would really, I, I've been very aware of some of the limitations of being a researcher that doesn't live in the NWT and um, would really like to be able to do some more interviews and to actually spend some time in communities involved in fishing considering a research trip in the next month. So if there is anybody that would like to um, to, to have me along to, to chat about fishing and some of the issues that I mentioned, I'd be really grateful to hear from you. Um, I mean, I'm also quite 
grateful for the fact that we have the internet to do certain forms of communication, but it's not the same as really being there in the flesh. So um, yeah, hoping to uh, to expand the research beyond um, Kakisa where we've done, where we've gathered most of our knowledge so far, um, and to be able to get a sense of whether these are issues that are facing other communities, particularly around the Great Slave Lake. Um, and we've been speaking to a few kind of partners at, at, in the territorial government to try and get a perspective of, of fr from some of the, the kind of government bodies as well. Um, so, yeah, if there is anyone who is involved directly in fishing that would like to be part of uh, talking to us about their experiences, please do get in touch. Thanks, Nikki. Okay, another question for you, Charlie. Apart from the five dimensions, could you consider 10 FAO elements of agroecology for your assessment? Because they think it's more broader than five elements. Yeah, it is. I mean, make, and Mindy's pro, um, paper, if you uh, take a look at it, she really, she mentioned the the 10 elements and kind of the point of that paper was to distill some of those elements to be suited to the Northern context. Um, so, uh, I think for our paper, we've chosen to stick with those five dimensions because they have already been thought through with um, with indigenous communities. So it made sense for us talking about fisheries in the north to to stick to those five dimensions for now. Um, but thank you for that reminder. I think there's actually twelve now. Jen might be able to um, correct me, but I feel <laughs> Jen, Jen, can you correct me? Other that I feel like there are more elements that have been added by other um, organizations. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's quick Google. Okay. Um, but just for the rest of the question around wetland management plans for the water body, I suspect that's something that other people who are not me are already thinking about um, in terms of the water stewardship strategy. So, uh, but that, that would be a really great thing to ask about whether different communities have wetland management plans that are looking at fish as part of broader water, water management strategy. So thank you for that suggestion. I'm gonna keep that in mind. Great, thanks. We have one last question uh, before uh, ending the session for today for uh, Jennifer again. Uh, how is the soil quality? Uh, they've heard that the Northwest Territories soil, soil quality makes growing through food very difficult at times, even as mm -hmm. the climate warms. Do you need to bring in new soil? What techniques, if necessary, have you used to improve soil quality? And could someone larger, uh, somewhat larger scale agricultural agriculture be possible in the NWT? Uh, so yes, the soil quality isn't the greatest. Um, some of the research that other co colleagues have been doing has actually been around soil sampling and mapping out soil across across the region. So they've been working with with communities, including Kisa, um, as well as a number of farmers in the Decho region, um, in order to do that work. So I can talk to you about Kakisa specifically. The soil isn't great. There's not, there's not really topsoil. It's, it's relatively acidic. Um, and so that definitely has posed some barriers to production in general. Within the greenhouses, we actually did bring in uh, topsoil from near Hay River. Um, and just because it just wasn't, it wasn't available to us otherwise. Um, so we've done, we've brought in a number of loads and we've also actually incorporated, um, chicken manure, um, from Hay River, um, from the old Hay River, uh, there was a chicken, um, like a poultry operation there many, many, many years ago. Um, and so we were able to access, uh, chicken manure as fertilizer from that, that location. Um, this this year we're going to be looking a lot more at how we continue to build soil so we're trying to use all of the different resources around us um charlie had spoken about agroecology and that agri agroecology also is really many of those principles are what we're trying to do within the garden one of those principles is not using external inputs right um so we have a very large amount of sort of wood chips. That's one thing that we've been using. I know that that's a little bit difficult because it locks in nutrients until it breaks down, but it's kind of where we're at right now as far as what we have to use. Um, recently, um, 
Andrew and I were actually able to go to Kenya and we visited um, a quite amazing permaculture farm there. And one of the things that they're doing on that farm is um, planting logs into the into the beds in like the sides of the beds um, and inoculating them with um, with fungi um, and um, sort of bacteria from the, the the forest area around and then keeping those water those watered and as they break down they release nutrients and they also help to build soil so I'm, I'm thinking about what we can do in Kikisa as far as trying to do that something like that um, for example also planting grasses so like sweet grass into the the garden plot itself um, in order to be able to build up that soil organic matter that we really need because we're, we're, we're definitely lacking it. I guess as far as like, sorry, um, you know, larger scale agriculture is concerned. I don't necessarily think that um, it is, it's never going to be on the same scale as that you get in the south. Um, the, the land just isn't there for it. But also, I don't think that it's the way generally that communities want to, to go um or individuals um, across the north the scale is very very different right so i think that um keeping things to a smaller scale um, and being able to provide food for the regional food system um be that yellow knife or or elsewhere is really kind of the focus of both communities and producers at, at this point. There's there's more than enough of that um, demand. So large scale agriculture, you know, while there's potential for it to happen, I don't think that it's something that's really ideally not on the agenda at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, so this is actually the last uh, webinar as part of this series. So I'd like to thank all of the presenters and also a special thanks to all of the webinar presenters, almost 30 that uh, participated in the series. I'd also like to thank our co-host today, the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems and all of our other co-host co organizations. I'd also like to thank Christina Chajandra for creating the beautiful uh, promotional and art for invitations for the webinars. And again, you can find all the webinar videos on the Northern Water Futures website. And as this is the last webinar, follow us on X or Twitter at Northern Water Futures underscore research or at Laurier Research for updates on future webinars. So thank you everyone for attending and thanks to all the presenters. <laughs>